Uh, welcome to uh, uveitis grand rounds. Uh, this is uh, our ongoing patient round series where we have a subspecialty that uh, a subspecialty themed rounds. Uh, we are uh, very lucky to have uh, Dr. Al Vitali chairing today's meeting. And without further ado, Dr. Vitali. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for being here. Welcome to uveitis specialty grand rounds. Um, I have this illustrious crew of uh, fellows and residents that uh, <coughs> we would like to present some representative cases uh, that kind of roll through our clinic uh, to illustrate our approach to the diagnosis and treatment of uveitis to arrive at a diagnosis because the diagnosis really matters because it impacts uh, the prognosis and the treatment of our patients. So just by way of introduction, as you know, uveitis uh, by definition, uh, involves inflammation of the uveal tract, but in, in parlance, it really, uh, common parlance, it's inflammation, intraocular inflammation of the eye, uh, any part of the eye. It can be either infectious or non-infectious, um, and those that are non-infectious are thought to be autoimmune or auto-inflammatory in origin. Importantly, there are masquerade syndromes, particularly neoplastic masquerades, and so all in all, uveitis is not one disease, but represents about 30 distinct entities with uh, typical clinical features, uh, course, and prognosis. It is not a trivial disease representing between 10 to 15 percent of blindness in the United States and is the fourth leading cause of visual loss after uh, diabetes and age-related macular degeneration, making the personal economic impact of potential visual loss possibly greater than that of age-related disease given the fact that the peak onset uh, is in the most productive years of life. So our, I would like to describe our approach uh, to the uveitis patient. As uh, William Osler said, you know, talk to your patients, they will tell you the diagnosis. So the history is extremely important, beginning with the ophthalmic history, medical history, and then eliciting things that may not come up in history through a review of systems. Then the ocular examination in which we uh, grade the uh, severity and stage of the inflammation and then assess the eye for structural complications in the front of the eye and the back of the eye, including posterior sneakia, macular edema, and choroidal neovascularization. Then a general medical exam is conducted to the extent that it can be carried out in the clinic, looking at the patient's skin, their joints for signs of arthritis or deformity, and then based on this information, formulate a differential diagnosis. So no labs have been performed. This is all history. So the differential diagnosis is uh, formulated uh, and characterized along several dimensions. One has to do with the anatomic location of the inflammation, whether or not it is uh, present in the anterior chamber, the vitreous, the retina or choroid, or all three compartments. Uh, the pattern of the inflammation, particularly in the back of the eyes, so pattern recognition is important. Uh, whether or not the inflammation is predominantly in the retina or in the choroid or both, or whether or not it's a multifocal or a posifocal uh, inflammatory condition whether or not it's granulomatous or not granulomatous by its clinical features. And then the presentation, course, and laterality. So is this an acute disease? Or is it a, recur a current, recurrent acute disease or a chronic disease? Because this will help characterize the type of uh, disease we're talking about, unilateral, bilateral, or alternating. Then is this disease purely in the eye, okay? Or what are the systemic host factors that are important? For example, is there a systemic underlying condition that may be associated with inflammation such as we see in sarcoidosis, multiple sclerosis, spondylized AIDS, or an iatrogenic immunosuppression? Is there an infection present? What are the demographics? The world is shrinking. We see lots of patients from all over the world here that, uh, in which certain diseases may be more uh, prone in certain populations. And then the associated signs and symptoms. The laboratory is then used after this to exclude infection, essentially, and to identify systemic disease that may impact mortality or morbidity. And it provides actually important prognostic information uh, for the physician and for the patient. So a patient with HLA B27 positive anterior uveitis, we can tell that patient with a certain amount of uh, certainty what the course of their disease is going to be like, as opposed to, say, for example, a patient with Bechet's disease or serpiginous, which will require long-term treatment and immunomodulatory therapy. And then a treatment plan is formulated based upon the diagnosis, um, and antimicrobial therapy is used in case of infection, 
a stepladder algorithm uh, employing non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication with immunomodulatory therapy as needed as either first-line treatment or as part of a steroid sparing strategy, and then to follow the patient closely to assess the treatment and to monitor the side effects of treatment. So we're going to kick it off with Dr. Zog, who is going to show us one of the diagnoses that we never want to miss. <laughs> All right, so we're going to just, just start off by <coughs> presenting a case. So um, this is a case of a 42-year-old. This is in 2006 when he first presented, and he's describing some floaters and some light sensitivity, not a lot of pain. He is HIV positive. Um, and his CD4 count by his report is low with a high viral load count. His last CD4 that we could find was 231 at the time of presentation. His uh, visual acuity is 2040 in each eye. Pinhole's a little bit better and his um, tensions are normal. On his exam, he has uh, anterior chamber cell. He also has uh, keratic precipitates and then he has vitreous cell. So he has uh, inflammation all over the eye. This is what is, uh, sometimes these don't project all that well, um, but this is what we're seeing on his exam. So if we look at the right eye, you can see that the, the details of the fundus just are not very clear. So he has some vitritis and then kind of some pigmented, some areas of depigmentation in the periphery and then kind of a circular depigmentation area sort of around the optic nerve. Um, just kind of little areas that are kind of subtle on the fundus findings here. We had some other imaging done, which doesn't project well again, but it sh sort of shows those areas where there was uh, some pigment changes. Kind of subtle, but uh, kind of some almost whitening here. And then on his fluorescein angiogram, um, this is kind of in the earlier phases of the angiogram, you kind of see some patchy filling of the choroid, which can be normal. As we go a little bit later, you'll, sh you'll start to see that you have, um, this is really late in the angiogram, and you're seeing kind of this area here that's abnormal, kind of some patchy hypo and hyper um, fluorescence. And this is highlighting one of those areas around the optic nerve. Again, sometimes these are pretty subtle unless you've been looking at a lot of these. This is uh, an abnormal area that corresponded to the color photos in that eye. And then again here, kind of this area that's a little bit hyperfluorescent really late in the angiogram. The optic nerve seems to be having some staining as well, maybe even some leakage. <coughs> this one, it's not a wide field view, but you can see kind of these uh, almost circular plaque-like areas that are showing up late in the angiogram. So what do, you, what do you do? You come up with a differential diagnosis. This patient has HIV. He's immunocompromised. His uh, CD4 count is very low. So there's infection is really high on the list in those patients. You also have some infiltrative diseases that could uh, present like this and inflammatory. But we're really thinking about a lot of these infectious things that could be happening to this patient. So what did he have done? He's a high-risk guy, so you kind of have to throw some high-risk things at him. So you do vitreous tap and inject, try to figure out what's going on back there. He had some phoscarnet that was injected into the vitreous. He's also put on uh, Valtrex. So you're treating CMV, and you're also covering some of those uh, herpes viruses as well. And then we did a, a lab workup. So his lab workup, CD4 count was 217. Um, the biggest thing is that he had an RPR and an FTA that were both uh, positive <coughs> in him. Um, his toxo was negative. Um, in HIV patients, they can definitely have more than one thing going on. And so sometimes you have to treat multiple infections. But in this case, it looks like uh, syphilis was the main diagnosis here. He had PCR in his vitreous that was done as well at the same time, and uh, CMV and the herpes viruses and toxo were all negative. Um, and anybody that you diagnose with syphilis, the next step is to get uh, cerebral spinal fluid um, to see if they have involvement um, in their central nervous system as well. And his was negative. So his, his diagnosis was syphilitic chorioretinitis. Um, he was allergic to penicillin, which is the main treatment for this. Um, the good thing about syphilis is it's very treatable. Um, Dr. Vitali likes to desensitize patients and use penicillin. Uh, 
You can use alternative uh, treatments, but this desensitization works really well. So the patient was admitted to the hospital, desensitized, treated with uh, IV penicillin. We talked about his lumbar puncture results, which is important in these patients. And uh, he actually resolved, which is kind of the rule in syphilitic uveitis, is that their vision usually gets better, um, especially if you can diagnose them early. And so he ended up 20-20 in both eyes. And that was uh, after about a year of follow-up. So this is what his fundus looked like um, after treatment. So you can still see some subtle changes of pigment um, going on, but overall things look uh, pretty quiet. The view is much clearer than it was before. So now this uh, gentleman is three years older. Again, HIV is 45 now in 2009. And he presents with a little bit of pain and decreased vision in his right eye for about four days. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, you, can, you can do it by syphilitic uh, puncture. Just uh, the one thing from the video was following on from the last video was uh, you said that you could do it with a small dose of puncture. Uh, is that enough volume for this patient? How much is this gentleman? So he had been off of his uh, HIV regimen for about four months. Yeah, he was. I don't know why he went off it for four months. It's just that he. So he, yeah, he was just a guy that plugged in for a guy at the clinic. Uh, it's, it's my understanding that he was following the same treatment. Just about the same. Same patient. Yeah, I mean, these medications are not cheap, so, but very effective. So he comes in with hand motion vision. Um, he has uh, two plus anterior chamber cell. He has some posterior synechia, pretty extensive area. Um, vitreous cell and haze as well. So again, uh, kind of a pan uveitis type picture. Um, on his uh, exam, we'll kind of see what his, his uh, fundus looks like. So this is his right eye. So now he has this large um, optic nerve mass, essentially. And then really hazy, you know, uh, inflammation of the retina as well. So again, HIV positive patient representing um, with a really bad uveitis. So again, you have to step back and wonder what's what's going on here. Um, big hyper autofluorescence here. Lots of problems with the vessels, bleeding, um, haziness, vasculitis. Lots of badness going on here. So you get some uh, an FA here that kind of shows some of the some of the same things kind of see that patchy kind of inflammation of the retina. This is actually in the uninvolved eye, in the left eye. And then that right eye just really not looking good. Really late in the angiogram. You go out over to the left eye, and he's got a little bit of staining around the disc, which is pretty normal, but he's got these little patches that make you wonder if the left eye is involved as well. So again, you have to take a step back, and, and your differential is still broad in this patient. His CD4 count is now 8. Um, he did have an RPR and an FTA that were, again, positive. And uh, what you do with these usually is you track um, the treatment of syphilis to make sure that they actually do clear the infection. So his titer had decreased down to 1 to 2 back in March of 2007. So his titer is back up with syphilis again. Um, everything else here was negative. His vitreous sample, though, he had some toxo that came back positive on PCR. So he has kind of two things going on at once. But the key here was that in his history, he had a clear um, historical point that he had a re-infection re, uh, with syphilis. So he was again introduced to, to another syphilis uh, case here. Um, so it looked like CMV retinitis, it could have been, if you look at the appearance. Um, you have syphilis <coughs> based on the serologies, and then you have toxo based on the PCR, and then there's all the other different things that it still, still could be involved here. So what do you do with a patient like this? You put them on everything. So 
valcyclovir um, for the possibility of uh, any herpes viruses. The antitoxo, so Bactrim is what he got. And then he had um, IV penicillin again after uh, desensitization. And then a prednisone taper as well. Got him back up on his heart and then treated him um, locally also with Predforte, Cyclogel, and Zymar. And then um, in his case, his CD4 count was so low, um, he had brain imaging as well to rule out any toxic lesions in his brain. So this is what he looked like a little bit later after some treatment. So he was uh, looking a lot better. A lot of the inflammation is gone. Still has some hemorrhage, and um, obviously the vessels are kind of attenuated from, from all the damage that had occurred. And that was what he looked like when he first came in, so you can kind of see the comparison of, of how much inflammation is down. So in this case, this is uh, now a, a syphilitic panuveitis that was a reinfection in that right eye. Um, and then we had to treat the other things there as well. His CD4 count um, remained pretty low. Um, it took a little bit of time for that to come up. But he ended up um, with really poor vision in that right eye long standing because of the, the damage there. That's what he looked at like at the last photos that I could find. So that um, large uh, optic nerve kind of granulomatous mass was kind of gone there mostly, but still poor vision. Yeah. Um, I am not 100% sure. Sometimes I can't always tell on the going back and looking at cases, but it was negative. It, it seems that just systemic penicillin really treats it all, and it really clears up the inflammation in the eye, too. You can treat locally with steroids to help with that, but uh, most of the time the penicillin alone will help to clear the vitritis in the cell and everything. So. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to show a couple other cases just to show how tricky syphilis can be, um, that it really is the great mimicker in, in the eye. Um, and so this is a 35-year-old male with a six-day history of decreased vision in his left eye. He's a high-risk individual. He has IV drug use, high-risk sexual activity. He tells us that he had a recent HIV test that was negative. Um, he's 2060 in both eyes on testing. And this is what his uh, retina looked like. So you can see... A pretty clear view to the back of the eye. The vessels look fine, um, but the optic nerve is swollen here. And then his left eye, again, a little bit of optic nerve swelling, but you can see kind of this large kind of coin-like lesion centrally right over the macula of uh, some depigmentation there. Um, you can see a little bit of uh, hyperfluorescence here on the left eye. The right eye actually looks pretty good. The optic nerve might have a little bit going on in both eyes. On the uh, early stages of the FA, what you see here is some hypofluorescence um, with some patchy hyperfluorescence. And then later in the angiogram, you see that same area with uh, a large kind of crescent-shaped uh, hyperautofluorescence. And then the optic nerve seems to be staining here as well. So on his, uh, he presented with kind of a classic uh, syphilis is, is what, we would, what we would say this looks like. Um, on exam, you could almost diagnose this. Um, but you would still go to lab testing in this patient as well. So he had an RPR that was reactive, an FTA that was positive. We retested him for HIV, and it was positive. Um, he had high CD4 counts. Um, had an MRI done that was normal. And again, after treatment, he improved to 2015-2020. So just a, a quick little case that shows, you know, patients can present with something completely different every time with syphilis. And again, treatment the resolution of visual acuity is the rule in these patients if you catch them early enough. Okay, so another one here, 50-year-old male um, complaining <coughs> of decreased vision. He has optic nerve swelling coming in. Um, the bad thing for this guy is he's NLP in his right eye from birth. It's, he's saying that he had a retinal detachment. He never saw out of that eye, and so this eye is just kind of gone. 
Um, his left eye, his baseline vision is 2070. He's decreased down to 2100. Um, no real significant past medical history that, that we can elucidate from him. Um, he has an APD in that right eye, and his eye is actually quiet on the, and this is what he looked like in his left eye. So you can see it's a little bit of a hazy view. Um, optic nerve is uh, swollen here, and then you've got this area of uh, pigment changes kind of out in the, in the periphery. So on his uh, imaging, the main thing that you're seeing here is a swollen optic nerve with some hemorrhages. And then same thing here, just a, a swollen optic nerve that kind of leaks late in the, in the angiogram. Maybe even some, uh, some potential CME there. So what does he have going on? He basically has an optic neuritis of some kind. Um, so he had a lab workup, and again, his RPR was positive. So he ended up uh, being treated again for neurosyphilis. Um, some of these cases I, I have limited information on. Dr. Vitali probably ha has a lot more, but that, that's another presentation, it's just a patient with an optic nerve swelling. So you have to think about syphilis in that case as well. Another patient, 29-year-old, came in with a week of a red pain fly, CD4 counts low, 167 with HIV. He's only had HIV for a week, so this is kind of a new diagnosis for him. Um, his visual acuity is down 2050. He has a really um, exuberant anterior chamber reaction. So he has fibrin in his anterior chamber, 3 plus vitreous cell, 2 plus haze, um, retinal whitening. So again, all chambers involved. This is a, a patient presenting with panuveitis. Um, so the differential diagnosis, again, is very broad in HIV patients. Infection is sort of at the top of your, of your list. Um, this is what his eye looked like. Um, kind of a bad photo, sorry. Um, but what you're seeing is over here in the periphery, you kind of have these like white areas that are actually above the retina. So kind of these pre-retinal infiltrates and uh, one here as well. A little bit better picture of it. Just kind of some little whitening areas above the retina, maybe some in here and up out here as well. So he had a vitreous biopsy and uh, he was admitted for treatment of toxoencephalus and then kind of a workup for this source. And uh, he ended up with CNS and systemic syphilis, so his um, LP was positive and had a, another good response to uh, penicillin. <coughs> this is a case of a patient in the UK that was sent to Dr. Vitali. Um, it seemed like it was sent to him to, as kind of like, can you help us with this case? And uh, this is a, a patient who had uh, PRP and IVT for diabetes. Um, and this is his baseline visual acuity, so 6 over 12. Um, essentially about 2040, 6 over 24, maybe like 2080. Um, and his vision was worse one month later, clear to LP in his left eye. So vision just really tanked after this treatment. Um, had an afferent pupillary defect and had a lot of inflammation going on in his eye. And he had this testing done over there. So he had an RPR that was positive, a TPPA that was really high. HIV was negative. So again, a patient with syphilis. And this is just a really classic... Uh, classic photo of what syphilis can present with. So it's these uh, pre-retinal kind of uh, whitening areas with kind of a retinitis and optic neuritis. Um, really pretty impressive inflammation here. You see the vessels are not healthy. You get a vasculitis with it, but it's really these kind of white pre-retinal infiltrates that are going on in this patient. Just kind of all over the retina. All right, this is probably my favorite one just because of the history that is the key point in this patient. So this is a 50-year-old female, and Dr. Vitali will ask you this question in clinic. Are they a citizen? And at first, I always thought that that meant, are they like a U.S. citizen? You know, do they have their green card or something? I wasn't exactly sure. But it's that they're an upstanding citizen. So church-going, upstanding citizen. Um, she has the, a lot of systemic things going on. So she has polyarthritis. She's having ulcers, rash on her knees, ankles. All kinds of stuff going on. And uh, she had been diagnosed with, uh, I think, birdshot initially. In, oh, was it mutes? Sorry. She was sent to Dr. Vitali for a, a consult to see how to treat her. And she had some old vitreous cells on exam. Pretty good vision, um, but kind of a lot of systemic things going on. This is what her eye looked like. It actually looked uh, pretty good um, on exam. Um, not a whole lot going on on the fundus photo on the right eye. In the periphery, maybe there's some pigment stuff going on, but pretty subtle on exam initially. Um, same thing with the left eye. You're not seeing a whole lot on, on her exam. Um, 
but her imaging kind of really shows some things that were going on. So what we're seeing on her uh, angiogram is you're, you're seeing kind of these patchy areas um, that are kind of filling a little bit abnormally. You see just kind of pigmentation things that are not normal as, as she's uh, filling her retina here. The same thing, kind of subtle things. Maybe there's a little bit of um, haze right in this area here, but kind of just pigment abnormalities and filling defects in the choroid. So yeah. Yeah. So this is the key point, is that she had a benign social history, but her husband was having problems with same-sex attraction, and they're currently separated. When I was looking up her case, her name changed, and so it was like hard for me to tell, is this the same patient? But I think we know why her name changed after this. Um, she was RPR, FTA positive. She had a positive LP and had IV penicillin treated for syphilis. So one of the issues with syphilis right now is it actually is on the rise. Um, from 2012 to 2013, it kind of doubled in rates. And it's mostly still young men having sex with men. And there are about 50,000 cases reported to the CDC a few years back. But there's no um, reporting that's required. Yeah. In Utah? Um, it's mostly men having sex with men here. It's probably, is, is the prevalence less in Utah? I, I really don't know. It's, it's hard to know. A lot of your risk. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, they report that. I see that going out. It's definitely going up. Here too. I don't know. <coughs> So there's uh, different stages to syphilis. Um, the primary stage is pretty rare to have ocular involvement, but you can have ocular involvement in secondary or tertiary. Um, there's also congenital late and late latent syphilis, and uh, again, those are those are all times that you can see syphilis affecting the eye. Um, if you have somebody in these situations, a lot of times that your treatment may not improve the condition as far as the systemic things and maybe even some of the late things that are going on in the eye. But uh, the key is to prevent kind of further damage with it. So there's no formal reporting. There was a good um, study that came out from the UK that there were about 50 cases per million of syphilis and there were about 0.3 per million of syphilitic uveitis. That kind of gives you an idea of how many um, cases of syphilitic uveitis there are. <coughs> it's pretty rare. It's still less than 1% of our uveitis cases that are coming in. Um, it's a lot higher in HIV patients though, about 16% of them that came in had uveitis um, from syphilis. So the presentation, really, you name it, it could be anything. Um, and so that's why it's called the great mimicker. It can present with any, any sort of uh, presentation. There are a, a couple of things that are classic, but uh, th it can really come as anything. So this just kind of shows it got cut off a little bit here. But every single system is involved. I was thinking maybe oculoplastics got out of it, but extra ocular motility, you can have cranial nerve palsy. So it's just everywhere um, in any of the stages of syphilis. The most common things that you see are uh, vitritis, iritis, KP, and retinitis. But you can see, again, anything. So because of the extreme variability, it's really the history. You have to get uncomfortable with the patient and talk to them about their true risk factors for HIV and STD, um, STDs. There's two distinct clinical patterns. It's those superficial retinal precipitates and then um, just acute posterior placoid chorio retinitis, which are two of the cases that I showed. Um, if you had to profile a patient, this is what it would be, HIV positive, middle-aged male. There are some classic OCT findings that show kind of disruption of the ISOS junction and then loss of the ELM in this left eye compared to the right eye on this patient. This shows kind of resolution of that with treatment. So you see the ELM come back in the ISOS junction kind of reform. Um, on ICG, you can see early and late confluent hypofluorescence, which is pretty specific for um, syphilis. On FA, you usually see just progressive diffuse leakage, and then the hyperautofluorescence is what we saw in that placoid-type lesion. 
So the serology, you want to get a non-treponemal test, a VDRRL or an RPR, as well as a treponemal test. So most of the time it seems like we're checking RPR and FTA. Um, in the, the CDC has this recommendation that they came out with um, that nobody really follows because there's extra steps in testing. It hasn't be w been widely adopted. But you essentially get an EIA. If that's positive, you get an RPR. If that's negative, you get a TPA. But we're, no, no one has really adopted this as of yet. Um, you can do direct testing with PCR of the aqueous. Again, we talked about that a little bit. And then uh, dark field microscopy is something that you can potentially do. Tracking treatment, you're using an RPR and a VDRL, the titers, to see if they're getting better. So then a couple of key things. If you diagnose syphilis, what do you do next? So the key is, is that ocular syphilis is neurosyphilis. And so you have to get a CSF evaluation, so get a, a lumbar puncture and always test for HIV. Treatment, there's a bunch of different treatments that you can do, but that are all approved for neurosyphilis. Um, but uh, IV penicillin is kind of what we do here. Don't treat um, with local therapy unless you have proper antimicrobials on board. So using steroids is fine as long as you're treating the underlying infection. And then just some take-home points. Um, always consider syphilis in the uveitis patient. The preretinal opacities of the acute posterior placoid chorioretinitis are kind of, uh, can be diagnostic of syphilis. Um, you can use enhanced imaging that is helpful, and then serologic diagnosis is really the way that you come up with a conclusion there. And again, if ocular syphilis gets get syphilis, get CSF and HIV testing. And that's it.
Okay. Um, so Jim and I are going to present a case uh, quickly. We'll try to, we have two cases left in a limited amount of time, so I'll move through the case presentation quickly. It's a classic presentation of a, of a diagnosis we see um, not too infrequently in GBRD clinics. So this is a 68-year-old Caucasian woman. In 2013, at an outside um, clinic, she was treated for a supratemporal BRVO and related CME with intravitreal Avastin. She responded well initially but then returned to that clinic in 2014 with a, a recurrence of CME, and along with that was found to have a mild detritus associated. Um, she, um, before coming to us as a second opinion referral, she had had two separate approximately one month papers of Durazole in both eyes, and by the time she got to us, she had been off of any topical treatment for one month. She complained, her chief complaint is blurry vision, more on the right than the left, and she also complained of worsening night vision. So these are medications. Uh, most of them are uh, over-the-counter count supplements. She's on uh, levothyroxine for thyroid and, a, and a baby aspirin uh, just for prevention of, of cardiac complications. Uh, her past medical history, hypothyroid. She had a recent mechanical fall from sleeping on the floor at home. She has a history of miscarriage. She had knee surgery in the distant past with a complication of a pulmonary embolism afterwards requiring anticoagulation. And recently we found out again she had another DVT requiring anticoagulation. She has no history of sexually transmitted disease and no known history of hypertension. Her family history is in uh, non-contributory. She lives in Idaho. She's a retired teacher. She's traveled to Prague in April um, of, the, of last year when we saw her. She has no history of IV drug use and she does not smoke. And her review of systems is only uh, notable for joint swelling, warmth, and redness in her hands. And when you look at her hands, she has uh, some sort of, uh, some uh, deformity of her fingers and hands, almost like a, a rheumatological defor deformity, a rheumatoid arthritis. So her uh, vision is 2040 right eye, 2025 left eye. She does not have an APD or, or remainder of her uh, initial exam is, is normal, pressures are normal. Um, anterior segment, it, notably she has a deep and quiet anterior chamber, mild cataract. <coughs> The vitreous is notable for about half plus cell and one plus haze in both eyes. This is pretty equivalent. And then let's go through the photos. So this is a fundus photo of a right eye. You can see that the view is somewhat hazy. The, the, the view of the optic nerve is a little bit obscured. The vessels appear normal. Remember, she had a supratemporal BRVO that was diagnosed in the past in this eye. So there's, there's some tortuosity to, um, to this arcade vessel and some collaterals that are formed. Um, you know, this, is, this looks like a, a uh, hypopigmented blonde fundus. Um, not sure what to make of these at the moment, but these will be better characterized with further imaging. You know, these, these, these hypopigmented spots in the, in the nasal mid-periphery. Her left eye looks very similar. Uh, one plus haze, you know, uh, disc looks sharp. Vessels look normal. Again, blonde fundus, but possibly some uh, interesting hypopigmented lesions in the, in the mid-nasal mid, mid periphery. So before we get to a differential diagnosis, there are other studies we can perform, and so we got those. Uh, I'll shout out, what, shout out what you would get for this patient. Fluorescein angiogram, ICG, out of fluorescence OCT. Okay, so let's start with the OCT. So here's her right eye OCT. She's got CME. You can see that this vessel is more engorged than the, you know, the corresponding inferior arcade vessel. Um, intraretinal fluid, left IOCT is totally normal. Okay, so interestingly, she's got the same amount of vitritis and haze in both eyes. The CME may be due to, you know, uh, related to her BRVO in the right eye. Here's her FA. This is early transit, right eye, 19 seconds. Vessels are filling normally. This is a wide, we got a wide field angiogram. So this, this is why it's so uh, minified and zoomed out. A little later, 32 seconds. And then much later, 2.5 minutes. You can see that the optic nerve is lighting up. So there's some uh, staining and leakage from the optic nerve. And interestingly, there is retinovascular leakage all over the place. Left eye is very similar, so 43 seconds, four minutes. Again, widespread retinovascular staining with leakage from the, from, from the vasculature. Optic nerve also 
uh, stains and leaks late. Here's their ICG, right eye 20 seconds, 32 seconds, looks like you know, the choroid seems to be filling appropriately. Remember, ICG looks at choroidal pathology, four minutes, okay. Now maybe you're start, we're starting to see some interesting hypopigmented spots in the periphery. And then if you wait long enough, we can see that there is, there is something interesting going on in the mid periphery here. And these, these areas are, you know, they correspond to the, to the, to the whitish lesions, li the whitish hypopigmented spots we saw on the <coughs> uh, color photograph. And same thing in the left eye. Early on, you don't see much, but as you get later in the ICG, she has this interesting, you know, mid peripheral ring of hypopigmented area. So let's just throw out some differential diagnosis. Remember, we can think of things that are infectious and non infectious. Anybody have any ideas? So let's review the case. So this is a 60 plus year old woman, Caucasian. She has uh, blurry vision, trouble with night vision, um, retinovascular staining on her FA, deep choroidal spots on her ICG, history of BRVO in the other eye, which may be a red herring. What are you thinking? Syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This is also a bilateral disease, okay, presenting basically equivalent in both eyes, and she has a mild detritus. So, any other ideas? Those are good. What that? TB's on the differential. So, so good. So let's let's think about inf and infectious and non-infectious. So, TB syphilis, um, <coughs> you know, uh, POHS is lower on the differential, but you know the, the lesions don't typically appear like this. Non-infectious, so I don't actually have the diagnosis up here. We'll see the diagnosis in a second. So sarcoid, multifocal choroiditis, and panuveitis, lymphoma, VTH, mutes, tick, hepatic ophthalmia, those are much lower on the list. So what would you do for workup? So throw out some ideas. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, what are you thinking of with that? Okay, so you know we, the, the workup. Uh, her ANA is negative. We got the ANA and we got some rheumatological testing because of her deformities in her hands and um, you know just to rule out that th th this would not be a typical presentation for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Her ACE and lysozyme were normal. FT and RPR were negative. Her PPD was negative. Uh, ESR is normal. She had. And she has an interesting history of a miscarriage, a PE, and a, and a DVT, so we sort of looked into that as well. Um, lupus anticoagulants, her, so her uh, hypercoagulab hypercoagulability labs were normal. Chest x area is unremarkable, but as Russell mentioned, her HLA 829 was positive. So, what's our diagnosis? Birdshot. So, Jim will talk about a little bit about birdshot. Anybody have any questions about the imaging and the workup and you know, our approach to the diagnosis. <coughs> so from her history, okay, uh, mild detritus, um, trouble with night vision, blurry vision, the typical features of the FA, which are retinovascular staining, and then the, the, the fundus appearance of these hypopigmented lesions in the nasal periphery, which show up in which are much more numerous in, in appearance on ICG that led us to think about birdshot. And that is a, this is a classic presentation of birdshot, I believe. So I can go through the utility of the talk that I saw. Yes, sorry. That's how I get. <laughs> you sure? Thanks. <laughs> All right, so like Nick said, I, I want to give Brian time to speak because he's got a good presentation. Well, the, the pattern of shotgun, yeah. I mean, that's, that's where they got their thing from. Yep. Birdshot, yeah. you know, pattern of shotgun. Exactly. So th this will kind of answer some of that of why we ordered the HLA 829 or why Dr. Vitale ordered it. Um, 
So the classic symptoms with which these patients present include floaters, photopsias, and nyctalopia. I think those are probably the three main ones that you'll hear most often. They can also sometimes describe problems with color vision, and sometimes they will actually tell you they have a spot in their vision where they don't see as well anymore. Um, oftentimes you'll find that once you start testing, but, but they don't always notice that until you point it out to them. Um, blurry vision, uh, our patient actually mentioned blurry vision. They don't always present with that, and that's a sort of a key point here is that visual acuity is not a great marker for activity of this disease. It's kind of like, I guess, uh, maybe glaucoma or retinitis pigmentosa in that regard, and that you can have a 20-20 patient with really active disease that's rapidly progressive, uh, and you've got to look beyond the visual acuity to follow these patients. But this is what they'll typically present <coughs> complaining of. Um, it's about 1% of referrals to tertiary centers for uveitis. It's a little over 5% of cases of posterior uveitis that we see. It's more often found in women than men, but men certainly have it. Dr. Vitalis follows a, a good number of men with birdshot. Uh, their average age is in the 50s. They're most commonly Caucasian. And then HLA-A29 is positive in 90% of patients, um, but uh, it's also present in 7% of Caucasians in general. So you don't want to just order this test on everyone because it's not going to be that useful of a test. But if you have suspicion for birdshot or if it's something that you're worried about missing, this can be a helpful test because if this is actually <coughs> negative, uh, that, that's when it's probably the most useful. If this test is negative, then you probably should start thinking about other diagnoses. So that's why we ordered it. If a patient had uh, sort of a classic presentation, and had this disease been negative, we might have had to go down different roads uh, to look for other diagnoses for this patient. Um, on exam, uh, Nick sort of pointed some of these out, but there are yellow lesions that are deep to the retina. They're usually smaller than a disc diameter. They can be asymmetric between eyes. Uh, they're often clustered closer to the nerve and most concentrated uh, nasal and inferior to the disc. There's not really uh, typically any pigment clumping on exam. Um, and these often appear a little bit after symptoms. Uh, as Nick pointed out, our patient had a pretty blonde fundus. Sometimes these are a little more obvious on exam. If the patient has a darker fundus, they stand out a little bit more. Uh, also on exam, you'll often see vitreous cell and haze. Uh, you can see a retinal vasculitis. You can see disc edema and macular edema. So that macular edema might be related to that old BRVO, but it might be actually be related to her diagnosis of birdshot. Um, that's sort of up in the air. You can find epiretinal membranes in these patients pretty often. And I say a relatively quiet anterior chamber because you can have half to one plus cell in the anterior chamber in these patients. That's not a rule. But if your, if your patient has a few cells in the anterior chamber, that does not rule this diagnosis out. They can have a little bit of inflammation anteriorly. The fluorescein angiogram, uh, it, the, the, it depends on the source you read, but there are lots of different descriptions of the spots that you'll see on a fluorescein angiogram, depending on the phase of the disease and uh, how active the disease is. Um, you'll often see some abnormalities sometimes correlating with the spots that you see on exam, but there's no consistent pattern with whether they'll be hyper or hypofluorescent, how many spots you'll see, and how well-defined they are. Other things that you can see, which we saw, are vessel leakage, disc leakage or staining. You can see neovascularization, which our patient did not have, so that doesn't rule this disease out. You can have that with birdshot. And the classic boards or OCAPS question for those taking that in a little bit is that there's quenching of dye from the retinal circulation a little earlier than you would expect. Um, so just to sort of review, with our patient, we saw the, the um, vascular leakage and the disc leakage as well. Um, you see it in the other eye as well. You can sort of see this uh, traveling into the macula and uh, creating a little bit of petaloid leakage as well uh, in the right eye where we saw the macular edema on the MCT. Uh, the ICG is really the test that, that gives this disease away. Um, so if you're suspicious of birdshot, like we mentioned, an HLA-829 is helpful, and an ICG is always helpful as well. This is where you get the classic hypofluorescent lesions in the intermediate to late phases on the imaging. Uh, the lesions typically exceed, exceed the number of lesions that you see on exam. Even if they have a darker fundus and the yellow lesions are more obvious, you'll often see far more hypopigmented lesions on the ICG uh, compared to what you saw at the slit lamp. Um, and then you get this diffuse hyperfluorescence of the choroid late uh, on the ICG.
Um, the OCT, you can see macular edema, and uh, sometimes you'll see some outer retinal abnormalities, which were not as prevalent in our patients. So uh, just to review the ICG again, these are those hypofluorescent spots, and we certainly didn't see that many yellow lesions on the color fundus photos, but we see a lot of them here. So with uh, further testing, which we'll go back to our patient in a minute, um, the patient can have uh, a negative waveform on a full field ERG, uh, which uh, basically means that there's a greater decrease in the B, weave, B wave than the A wave. Uh, late in the disease, uh, the entire ERG can go flat. So the B wave tends to go first and the A wave follows. Treatment, which we'll get into in a second, can actually improve the ERG over time. It's not a treatment, it's not a change that you'll see after a week of treatment, but it can improve a little bit. Um, and the most helpful uh, parts of the ERG are the scotopic B wave amplitudes and the 30 hertz flicker implicit times. Visual fields are also helpful for following these patients long term. Uh, they tend to have any number of different changes. They can have peripheral constriction, arcuate defects, multiple foci of field loss, but uh, the abnormalities and mean deviation can be helpful to follow for these patients. And a 24-2 is not uh, often good enough to really follow these patients long term. You want to get out to that peripheral field. So a 30-2 or a gold non-visual field are helpful. Um, most of these patients will actually get worse over time uh, if they have no treatment. And the treatment uh, does tend to decrease the chances of bad visual outcomes. What 20% of patients would do just fine without treatment is a good question, and it's hard to identify them. So um, this is a bit of a controversy, which we'll open up to the floor in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, is it worth treating these patients or not? And there's not a general consensus on that answer. If you choose to treat, steroids are generally not sufficient as monotherapy. They're good to start at the beginning, and you can add them on top of these other therapies to take care of specific aspects of the disease, like macular edema. Um, and they can be oral subtenons or intraocular. But immunomodulatory therapy is really what's helpful for these patients in the long term. And you typically start with an anti-metabolite. And if that's not doing the trick, if that's not stabilizing the disease and keeping it from progressing, you can add uh, these other um, immunomodulatory medications below. Uh, the way you would determine if these medications are helping or not is, again, not by checking the visual acuity on each visit, but by checking how the visual field is changing long term and how the ERG is changing long term and checking active disease at the slit lamp, looking for active haze and macular edema and those sorts of things. So you want to look at a lot more than just visual acuity with these patients, I think is one of the take home messages here. Um, and I'll turn it back to Nick just, or I, you want me to just finish, just save time for Brian, okay. So with our patients specifically, uh, we did get Goldman visual fields, which shows some general, uh, um, mostly nasal peripheral field uh, loss, uh, same with the left eye. And if we move on to the ERG, she did have some changes on her ERG with a 30 hertz flicker um, and the scotopic uh, scotopic waves as well. But to get to the real discussion here, um, there are some controversies with this disease, which include what's the role of HLA-A29, which thank you, Dr. Valentine, for that question, because um, as I mentioned, a lot of people have a positive HLA-A29 and don't have birdshot. So when is the right time to order this test? Another question to be asked is should all patients be treated? because uh, as I mentioned, some patients do just fine without treatment, and the treatments that I mentioned do have side effects. They're not benign drugs, and we're talking about putting patients on these for a very long <coughs> period of time. They're not gonna be on them for three months and then stop. We're talking about years of treatment. Uh, how long should patients be treatment? Should patients be treated, and what's the best method and frequency for monitoring the disease? At this institution, we tend to follow them with fields and ERGs and seeing them in clinic, and how is remission defined? At what point do you say this, this disease is stable, we're okay to stop treatment and just watch them? Um, but I'd open it to the floor if anyone has comments on these issues or questions or anything. Yes? So what causes hypofluorescence in the eye? That's a good question. I don't know. Do I people know that? Most likely it's 
I'll say on that note, from an anecdotal standpoint, I think most of the residents and fellows here have seen patients in Dr. Vitali's clinics who have gotten tired of the IMP therapy and have decided to go off of it. And then they come back three years later and you look through their chart and they were stable for a long time. They sort of disappeared for a while and they come back and their ERGs are flat and their fields are much more constricted. That's not exactly a prospective trial, but um, it is kind of upsetting when that happens. You, know, you see these large changes when they stop their treatment. Yes, Dr. Mbadi. Tends to be systemic therapy. Um, the intravitreal drugs that we use for these patients tend to be steroids uh, if they're warranted. But no, not, not intravitreal methotrexate. All, all of these are, that's a good question, all of these are systemic, systemically administered. Turn it over to Brian. Oh, it's, it's nine o'clock. No. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <Yeah>. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs>